Here we go. This is in uh, the legacy of naming and necessity by Nathan Salmon uh, in Theoria, because uh, you know Saul Kripke died, and might as well say something. I don't think I've said much about it on the uh, naming and necessity on philosophy roulette. So you can go through this quick. Okay. So as always, ask questions. Let me know along the way. This is you know this is a uh, history paper of philosophy though. Nearly 40 years ago, at the ripe old age of 29, a logic prodigy from Omaha, Nebraska, gave a series of three talks that would change philosophy. Working without any written notes or text... Let's see, can I zoom in on this? This is teeny. There we go. Working without any wrote, written text or notes, Saul Kripke gave these talks in a casual, informal, almost conversational style. The impact of his ideas was colossal. The talks were transcribed and then published as an article and later as, as a monograph with a newer preface. It would be difficult to overstate the work's significance. Kripke, Naming and Necessity, is a work of genius that has withstood the test of time. By any reasonable standard, it ranks with the best philosophical work ever. I don't know if I buy that, but okay. I feel extraordinarily fortunate to have begun my own study of philosophy at a time when a work as inspired and as inspiring as this was available to study, to learn from, to respond to, to go back to and think more about, and to profit from. Naming a necessity is an intellectual treasure. On a personal note, I first met Saul with very keen anticipation at the University of California, Los Angeles in the spring of 1972 when we were both young men. That academic year of 1971-1972 was the most educationally valuable year of my life. I was a junior, Saul was only 10 years my senior, and he still is, and already a professor at Princeton University. It was my first year studying philosophy beyond the level of introductory courses. That year I took a course on Frege from Tyler Burge, a course on the later Wittgenstein from the late Keith Donnellan, a course in Intermediate Logic from David Kaplan, a course in the Philosophy of Mathematics from the late great Alonzo Church, and topping it all, an undergraduate course on Frege and Russell's Philosophies of Language from Saul. Let me tell you, anyone who just heard, read that, that is the most stacked fucking undergraduate like lineup you will ever, ever hear about in analytic philosophy. Like you will not get a more stacked lineup of teachers on like this, these sorts of analytic philosophy topics. Like, oh my God, like, oh my God, like seriously, like, th yeah, they say, um, educationally valuable year of your life. Yeah. You just had like. An, like a, that's like an all-star list of like teachers and topics <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so in addition although I was far too green to follow most of the discussion I attended Saul's graduate seminar on naming and necessity also attended by Berg's Donlin, Kaplan, Alvin Plantinga among many others I learned more philosophy and more about how to think philosophically that year than I did during the rest of my life yeah you're that's like a you're going to get beaten up if you're in a room with all of them, like mentally beaten up, that is. I did not get the opportunity to meet Hillary Putnam until much later. That is probably just as well. Had I taken a course from Hillary as well that year, my brain might have exploded from exposure to too much sheer talent and intellect in too short a span of time. Yeah, that's probably accurate. Throughout the 1970s, I took more courses from Saul and restudy naming a necessity numerous times. Of course, my relationship with Saul has evolved over the years, during which we have both we've been both friends and colleagues, but I'm happy to say that I've never stopped learning from him. Philosophers the world over are deeply indebted to naming a necessity, and none more so than I am. My own doctoral dissertation and an entire generation of dissertations across the globe have been based in one way or another on this work by a philosopher who himself never wrote a doctoral dissertation. Naming a necessity has generated a huge literature to which many here at this conference have contributed. Among the contributors to that literature is Saul himself, with no fewer than three brilliant sequels. Speaker's Reference and Semantic Reference, 1979. A Puzzle About Belief, 1976. A Reference in Existence, the John Locke, lect uh, John Locke Lectures, 2003. 2013, excuse me. The last of these was put into print four decades later, after the lectures were delivered. Ostensibly and in fact, the central burden of naming a necessity was to refute a particular kind of theory about the semantic properties of proper names and related linguistic items and to supplant it with a very different picture, Saul's words, of how these expressions work. But 
the book is so much more than that. Looking just at the vast literature spawned by naming a necessity, one might not even guess that at that an issue concerning the semantics of proper names lies at its core. Remarkably, Saul was able to bring his arguments concerning names to bear on a host of seemingly unrelated or only distantly related issues, including issues concerning such metaphysical notions as necessity, modal essentialism, and identity, such epistemological notions as empiricism and a priority, and such issues in philosophy of mind as materialism, dualism, and the mind, body problem. I, dis I distinguish between modal essentialism and the more dubious doctrine or purported doctrine that subsequently appropriated the term essentialism. Other philosophers, especially younger philosophers, sometimes attempt something this ambitious. Such efforts generally fail miserably, never to see the light of day. Saul not only succeeded, but his naming and necessity set much of the philosophy on a new and straighter course. No philosopher since has accomplished anything quite like it and regrettably, much of philosophy has lost its way since naming a necessity. Uh, I mean, you can like naming a necessity, but do not be accusing the rest of us of failing. We don't all like naming a necessity as much as you do. <laughs> like, I'm on a... There's a divide in, philo in like, uh, analytic philosophy, and I'm in, most people are on this side, this, like, Saul's naming necessity side. I'm one of the very few people off in the corner that was never there and never tried to get there and, like, wasn't. So it's, like, it's funny. But, like, it's, like, yeah, I understand naming a necessity, or at least I understand something of naming a necessity, but I was never on Saul's side, actually. <laughs> or not, never, like, this far onto his side. Some of the important ideas advanced in naming necessity did not yet have the names they are known by today. For example, the, doctor, the doctrines of hexaetism and, most significantly, direct reference. I mean, yeah. Hexaetism is from... Uh, is a, I mean, this is kind of unfair. Yes, people call things hexaetism now, except hexaetism is from uh, medieval philosophy. So it's like, that people did know about them, but like... It was just different, and then people start calling it different. <clears throat> okay, d and yeah, direct reference is what we call something now. Author says, I believe David Kaplan coined both of these terms. I don't think uh, hexaetism, I mean, I'd have to be very confused. There's quidditism and hexaetism, and they're mi uh, medieval philosophy terms. It's like, nah. At least I could be wrong about that, but I don't think so. At least one term coined in naming a necessity has come has become a philosophical household name, a rigid designator. Yeah. It is ironic that this central and tremendously influ influential idea is still widely misunderstood. This alone is justification enough for philosophy PhD programs to require at least some exposure to modal logic. Among the many I other ideas that naming necessity has contributed to current philosophy are the following, a partial list. And there's a quotes. The recognition that necessity and a priority are different, even to some extent independent, and likewise regarding contingency and a posteriority. Two, that a necessary truth might nevertheless in some senses have turned out otherwise. Three, the recognition that necessity and analyticity are similarly different and likewise regarding contingency and syntheticity. Uh, what was it next? A sensible realism about necessity in possible worlds, a modal realism free of the previous confusions of other philosophers, such as anti hexaetism or cross world counterpart theory. Next, the exposure, the exposure of the problem of cross world identification as largely a pseudo problem. See, these are things I actually have problems with. Like, there, there were other people on the other sides. I'm on the other side from the, these things. This is when I said these are the things where I disagree. I think there's other ways of doing cross-world identity than Saul thought. <clears throat> okay, next, the recognition that some substantive doctrine of modal essentialism, far from being a confusion committed by careless thinkers, is in fact correct. In particular, that the original makeup of certain composite individuals yields a modally essential property, and the makeup of a composite substance, chemical a compound, likewise yields a modal essential property. You know, this is just reading. I, I mean, I don't know. I take it most people are not uh, this far in the weeds in analytic uh, philosophy or logic. It's like these are just saying like things that Saul wanted to be true. I don't know if they are true, but Saul definitely thought they were. And a lot of people thought they were. I'm not so sure about this. Like, I'm really not. Um, 
but people definitely think uh, there are definitely people that think along these lines. All right, so next, a particular way of arguing for some versions of modal essentialism that something must have a certain property to exist because anything without the property would have to be a different thing. Next, that in considering a particular class of possible worlds, a class need not be characterized qualitatively and instead is legitimately stipulated. Yeah, you can stipulate shit. That's fine. That analogously, in talking about a particular kind, a particular individual, one need not characterize the individual qualitatively and instead may directly designate the individual without describing it. Yeah, you can just say that dude, that guy there. You don't have to describe it. Next, that a description is sometimes used to fix the reference of a name without turning the name into a synonym of the description. Sure. Next, that the mechanism of fixing the reference of a name yields examples of statements that are contingent and yet a priori. Sure. The recognition that in most cases names are not tied even this closely to descriptions and that in the normal case reference is fixed contextually rather than descriptively. Okay. That designating names are invariably rigid designators so that true identity statements with two names are always necessary, necessarily, are ne always necessary even if they are not a priori. A rigid designator, just for anyone who doesn't know, is like you are going to describe something and it, that description always designates the same objects. So certain designating names, like you could say Nogur Zero, rigidly designates me in all the world so it's always pointing to the same object so that just so anyone who doesn't know what the rigid rigid designator is it's always pointing to the same object across all possible worlds so if like you know i was doing a different paper tonight and so there'd be like two versions of me in two possible worlds in this world i'm reading this paper and in another world i'm reading a different paper no zero still applies to the same person okay Next, that certain general terms, including at least natural kind terms and terms for mental phenomena, for example, pain, are like proper names in many of these same respects. And finally, yeah, because like, think about that. Why would you want to be able to name pain in all possible worlds? Because the pain you feel in this world is the same as like if like uh, you like you in a different place, but like you still want to have the same name for it because if it had a different name for pain, it might be a different thing. Something else was different, like weird. But like if when you say pain and a lot of other names, they still pick out the same shit in different situations. And you need to do that or else we can't make sense of the other situations either. Right, and last, that some terms, for example, names from fiction and myth are rigid non-designators. So that is, in some sense, impossible for Sherlock Holmes or, unicor or unicorns to exist. Yes, because if you have Sherlock Holmes picks out the same object but only in the book it doesn't designate um an actual thing so it's a rigid non-designator it's rigidly describing something that does not exist <coughs> okay some of these important ideas led subsequently to further significant advances advantages such as force forceful arguments excuse me forceful arguments that the correct propositional logic of metaphysical modality is rather weak weaker even than s4 I always find this weird when people are applying uh, the, they say certain logics have to be the right logic, but okay. No one, especially the modal logics, but whatever's. Besides Saul, one of my favorite philosophers is Woody Allen, and one of my favorite words of wisdom of, of his is the following. He said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work, I want to achieve it through not dying. By the age of 30, with naming a necessity and a few other astonishing accomplishments under his belt, Saul Kripke had already achieved the kind of immortality that Woody Allen does not want to have. Like Saul, both David Kaplan and Hillary Putnam will also live on through their brilliant contributions to logic and philosophy long after most of the rest of us are forgotten. Yeah, he's going to live on. Saul's going to be around for a long time in uh, his uh, writings. <sighs> Okay, I mean, thank you all for uh, indulging me. Just this little uh, thing on um, naming a necessity. And this was, uh, I think this was, uh, what's it called? This is a reprint of some, in tw like, because of, for the 40th uh, anniversary of it. But these remarks were originally presented, and this is the uh, first written up, as a keynote address for the opening of the Saul Kripke Center at the CUNY Graduate Center on May 23rd, 2008, and by way of introducing a panel discussion among David Kaplan, Saul Kripke, and Hilary Putnam. So yeah, so this was just like, you know, gushing praise for these people at the time. Um, yeah. 
Um, there is also going to be a... I don't think I'm going to go. I could probably weasel my way in at this point if I wanted to. There's going to be a... Uh, oh, I'm going to sneeze. Uh, there's going to be a naming and associate like 50, I guess, or 40, whatever it is. Yeah, 50. Uh, conference at CUNY Grad Center here in New York um, in two weeks. No, next week. So, yeah. So, there's going to be a lot more of like this sort of stuff going on. I uh, should ask. Maybe I'll go get a beer with some of the people. It might be interesting. Okay. But, yeah, thank you for all for indulging me uh, this one.